Old Cornel's Secret Without a word of a lie, on the night of my arrival at the windmill, there was a score of rabbits sitting in a circle on the platform, warming their paws in the light of the moon. In the time it took to open a gable window, pfft, the whole platform was in flight, their little white backsides scurrying away, tails in air, into the bushes. I hope very much they will come back. Someone else also, very taken aback on seeing me, is the tenant of the first floor, a sinister old owl with the head of a thinker, who has lived in the mill for more than twenty years. I found him erect and still on the driving shaft in the midst of plaster and broken tiles. He looked at me for a moment with his round eye, then, quite startled at not recognising me, he began to go, Ooh! Ooh! and to shake his grey, dusty wings laboriously. These thinkers, they never use a brush. But does that matter, such as he is with his blinking eyes and glum look, this silent tenant pleases me much better than any other, and I hasten to renew his lease. He retains, as in the past, the whole upper story of the mill with an entrance through the roof. For myself, I retain the lower story, a small whitewashed room, low and vaulted like a refectory in a monastery. It was there that an old fife player, Francais Mamai, who comes now and then to drink a glass of mulled wine with me, told me the story the other evening of a little village drama which took place at my windmill some twenty years ago. I was moved by his tale, and I will try and retell it to you just as I heard it. Imagine for a moment that you are sitting with a pot of spiced wine before you, and that it is an old fife player who is talking to you. Our country, monsieur, has not always been the dead and songless place it is today. In former days the flower trade flourished here, and the farmers for ten leagues around used to bring us their wheat to grind. The hills all about the village were dotted with windmills. Whichever way you looked, you could see sails turning in the mistral above the pines, and long strings of little donkeys laden with sacks going up and down the paths. And all week long it was a joy to hear on these hilltops the cracking of whips, the creaking of the canvas of the sails, and the shouts of the miller's men. On Sundays, parties of us would climb up to the windmills, and the millers would stand us all a glass of muscatel. The miller's wives were dressed like queens, with their lace fichus and gold crosses. I would always bring my fife, and they all used to dance the farandole far into the night. These windmills, you see, were not only the wealth of our land, they were its pride and joy. Unfortunately, some Frenchmen from Paris had the idea of setting up a steam-driven flour mill on the road to Tarascon. As the saying goes, everybody has a penny to spend at a new alehouse, and people began to get into the habit of sending their wheat to these fine new flour mills, and soon there was no work left for the poor windmills. For a time they tried to make a fight of it, but steam power was too much for them, and, alas and alack, one after another they were all forced to close. The little donkeys were seen no more, the fine miller's wives sold their gold crosses. No more muscatel, no more farandoles, the mistral could blow its hardest, the sails remained motionless. Then, one fine day, the local government officials had all these ruined windmills pulled down, and vines and olive trees were planted where they had stood. Yet in the midst of this catastrophe, one windmill held out and kept on bravely turning its sails despite all the steam-driven flour mills. It was the mill of Old Corny, the same one in which, at this very moment, we are spending such a friendly evening. Old Corny was a miller who had practised his craft for sixty years, an achievement of which he was more than proud. The intrusion of the flour mills maddened him to a state of fury. For a week he was to be seen running about the village seeking support, bellowing accusations that their aim was to poison all Provence with the flour from their steam-driven mills. 
Don't go near them, he would say. Those thieves are using steam to make bread. It's an invention of the devil. I use the Mistral and the Tramontane, good winds invented by God. And he would sing the praises of the windmills, but no one listened to him. Then, in a fury, the old man shut himself up in his windmill and lived all alone like a wild beast. He would not even let his little granddaughter remain with him, a young girl, only fifteen, named Vivette, whose parents were dead and who had no one else in the world except her grandfather. The poor child had to earn her own living working on farms, harvesting, silkworm picking or olive gathering. And yet her grandfather appeared to love the child very much. He often seemed to find himself walking four leagues in the heat of the day to see her at the farm where she was working, and when he was with her he would gaze at her for hours at a time, weeping. Everybody thought the old miller had sent Vivette away to avoid the cost of keeping her, and it did him no good in their eyes to allow his granddaughter to wander from one farm to another, exposed to the coarse jokes of the shepherds and to all the misery endured by young girls in service. People also thought it disgraceful that a well-known man like old Corny, who had always kept his self-respect, should be going about the streets like a complete vagabond, barefooted, holes in his cap, his waistband in rags. Indeed, when we older people used to see him coming into Mass on Sundays, we used to feel ashamed for him, and Corny realized this so much he no longer dared come and sit in the church warden's pew. He always remained at the back of the church, near the holy water, with the beggars. There was one thing, though, about old Corny that puzzled many people. For a long time nobody in the village had taken him any corn, yet the sails of his windmill kept turning as in the old days. In the evening we would meet the old man on the paths, driving his donkey laden with big sacks of flour before him. "'Good evening, Corny," the peasants would shout. The mill's still working, is it? Never stops, my lads, the old man would reply cheerfully. We don't lack for work, thanks be to God. But then, if anyone asked him where the devil he got so much work from, he would put his finger to his lips and answer solemnly, Keep it quiet. I'm working for the export trade. Nobody could squeeze a thing more out of him. As for putting your nose inside his mill, it was useless to think of it. Not even little Vivette could get in there. Whenever you passed by his mill, you would see the door closed, the great sails always moving, the old donkey grazing on the platform, and a big, lean cat lying in the sun on the window ledge, giving you an evil look. There was something mysterious about all this, and it set people's tongues wagging. Everyone had his own theory about old Corny's secret, but the general opinion was there were more bags of money in that windmill than there were sacks of flour. However, everything was discovered in the end. Here is how it all came out. One fine day, whilst the young people were dancing to my fife, I discovered that my eldest boy and little Vivette had fallen in love with each other. All in all, I was not too displeased, because, after all, the name of Corny was greatly respected in the district, and besides, it would be a delight to me to see that pretty little Vivette trotting about the house. Moreover, as the two of them often had the chance of being together, I decided to settle the business at once, in case of accidents. So I went up the hill to have a word with the grandfather. You should have seen the welcome I got from the old devil. He wouldn't even open his door. I explained my business as well as I could through the keyhole, with that skinny villain of a cat spitting at me like a fiend above my head. The old man didn't give me time to finish. He shouted at me in the most rude way to get back to my flute and to go and find one of the girls from the flour mills if I was in a hurry to get my son married. Well, you can imagine how my blood boiled to be spoken to like that, but I had sense enough to control myself and leaving the old fool to his millstones, I went home and told the children how I had been treated. The poor innocents couldn't believe it possible. They begged me to let them go up to the mill and speak to him themselves. I hadn't the heart to refuse, and off they went as fast as they could. When they got up there, old Corny had just gone out. The door was double-locked, but the old fellow had left his ladder outside which immediately gave the youngsters the idea of getting in by the window to see what was inside this mill everybody was talking about. The mystery deepened. The grinding room 
was empty. Not one sack, not one grain of corn, not the faintest sign of flour on the walls, nor on the cobwebs. There wasn't even the good, warm smell of crushed wheat that fills all windmills like a perfume. The main shaft was covered with dust, and the big, lean cat was lying asleep on it. The downstairs room had the same neglected, abandoned look. An unmade bed, a few rags, a piece of loaf on one of the steps of the stairs, and then, there, in one corner, three or four sacks which had burst open, spilling out broken plaster and other rubbish from pulled-down windmills. So that was old Corny's secret. It was this debris of plaster, bricks and mortar that he had been promenading up and down the paths every evening to save the honour of his mill and make people think it was still grinding wheat and producing flour. Poor old Corny and his mill. The steam mills had robbed them of their last customer long ago. The sails had kept turning, but the millstones had nothing to grind. The two young people came back in tears and told me what they had seen. I had a feeling of deep sorrow as I listened to them. Without losing a moment, I ran to my neighbours, quickly told them the facts, and immediately it was agreed we must set off at once to Corny's mill with all the wheat we could muster. And that's what we did. The whole village set out, and we arrived at the top of the hill with a procession of donkeys laden with corn, with real corn this time. The mill door stood wide open. In front of it, seated on a bag of plaster, was old Corny, with his head in his hands, weeping. He had just returned, and finding someone had entered the mill whilst he was away, had realised that his sad secret was his no longer. "'Woe is me!' he was saying. "'Now there's nothing to do but die!' I have brought shame on my mill. And he sobbed as though his heart were breaking, calling his windmill all sorts of pet names, speaking to it as if it were a real person. It is then that the donkeys arrive on the platform, and we all begin to shout at the top of our voices, just as we used to in the good old days. Hello there in the mill! Ho there, Master Corny! And now the sacks are piling up in front of the door, and all around the golden-brown corn is overflowing onto the ground. Old Corny stared, his eyes wide. He had picked up some of the corn, and holding it in the palm of his hand, he was saying over and over again, half laughing and half weeping, "'It's corn, dear Lord in heaven, real corn! Let me look at it!' Then, turning towards us, Ah, oh, I knew so well you would come back to me. Those flower millers with their steam engines, they're all a lot of thieves. We wanted to carry him on our shoulders in triumph to the village. No, no, my lads, before anything else, I must go and give my mill something to eat. Just think, it hasn't been able to get its teeth into anything for such a long time. And it brought tears to our eyes to see the poor old man bustling about, slitting open the sacks, keeping an eye on the millstone as it crushed the corn and sent the fine dust from the wheat rising to the ceiling. In fairness to ourselves, you must allow us this. From that day forward, we never let the old miller want for work. But then, one morning, old Corny died, and the sails of our last windmill stopped turning forever this time. Corny dead, no one took his place. What can you expect, monsieur? Everything comes to an end in this world, and we shall have to get used to the idea that the windmills are things of the past, like the boats pulled by horses up the Rhone, and our local courts of justice, and the long tailcoats with flowers embroidered on them that the men used to wear.